Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for your patience while we uh, got our technical ducks in a row. Um, so good morning. I'm pleased to welcome everyone to this special meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. My name is Jennifer Urban. I am the chairperson of the board for the agency. Today is July 28th, 2022, and this is a special meeting pursuant to government code section 11125.4, about which I will explain more in a moment. Before we get started with the substance of the meeting, as usual, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like to please ask everyone to check that your microphone is muted when you are not speaking. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. Additionally, please note that this meeting is being recorded. We are meeting remotely today in accordance with government code section 11133 as amended by SB 189. Members of the public are welcome to join via Zoom, video conference or telephone and directions for joining the meeting are in the meeting notice. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by the board members. I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker um, in the public comment session will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. Let's take a moment now um, for those of you who might wish to participate to note um, that if you wish to speak on an item, you will please use the raise your hand function which is in the reaction feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you'd like to take a moment to locate that now, please do. Please also note that our moderator will call on you after you raise your hand and will request that you unmute yourself for comment. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary and you can input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting as well. My thanks to the board members for their service and everyone working to make the meeting possible, um, especially everyone on staff at the California Privacy Protection Agency and the Office of the Attorney General supporting us today, um, uh, particularly for a special meeting, um, which requires a lot of work on short notice. Uh, Mr. Milad Dalju, who is acting as our meeting counsel. Thank you, Mr. Dalju. Ms. Trini Hurtado, who is our moderator. Um, and Ms. Stacey Heinsen organized administrative staffing and resources. I would also like to thank Brian Souble, our interim general counsel, Nelson Richards, California Privacy Protection Agency attorney who's here with us today, and Von, Von Chiambira, who's our deputy director of administration. And as ever, I'd like to express my gratitude for the team at the Department of Consumer Affairs for managing our communications and um, the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of General Services, the Office of the Attorney General, and other agencies who continue um, to support us. I now call this special meeting to order at 9.05 a.m. and we'll ask our moderator, Ms. Hurtado, to please conduct the roll call. Yes, good morning. Uh, Ms. Urban? Present. Ms. De La Torre? Present. Mr. Lay? Present. Ms. Sierra? Present. Mr. Thompson? Present. All members are present. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. The board has established a quorum. I would like to let the board members know that we will take a roll call vote on action items. Now, as I mentioned, this is a special meeting of the board called pursuant to government code section 11125.4, which is part of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, which allows for board meetings on 48 hours notice instead of our usual 10 days notice for certain purposes when necessary. In particular, this meeting has been called pursuant to government code section 11125.4 subdivision A2, which allows for special meetings to consider proposed legislation. As indicated in the agenda, we have convened a special meeting today to discuss a matter of proposed legislation on which the board must consider immediate action. The Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act at government code section 11125.4 subdivision C requires that the board make a finding of necessity to hold a meeting on less than 10 days advance notice before we proceed. Specifically, to continue with this special meeting, 
the board must determine whether to the delay necessitated by providing 10 days notice would impose a substantial hardship on the board or that immediate action is required to protect the public interest or both. The finding of necessity must be made by duly seconded motion in open session. Please also note that to pass or carry, the motion to adopt the finding must receive a supermajority vote, either a unanimous vote if less than two thirds of the members are present or if more members are present, a two thirds majority. So today we would need a two thirds majority, which because we are five members, I believe is four um, out of five. If the motion does not pass or carry by the required supermajority vote, the special meeting cannot go forward. The finding of necessity requires specific factual findings. These findings will be set forth in the motion. So I will put the motion on the table with the findings, ask for a movement and a second, then call for board discussion and comment so we all know what we're talking about. Then I will call for public comment before we vote. Accordingly, may I please have a motion and a second to adopt the following. Factual finding one, the board finds that providing 10 days advance notice of this meeting would pose a substantial hardship on the board and immediate action is required by the board to protect the public interest. In that, the House of Representatives of the United States Congress is actively pursuing a bill, the American Data Protection and Privacy Act that seeks to preempt much of the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018 as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020. And that would have substantial effects in California law and its protections for Californians. And that similar bills may be under development in the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate. Finding two, the board finds that the United States House of Representatives advanced the American Data Privacy and Protection and Privacy Act, excuse me, out of the Energy and Commerce Committee last week. Finding three, the board finds that if the board had to wait a full 10 days to meet, to discuss and provide guidance on this legislation, the board could be deprived of the ability to timely take guidance from staff on the effect of this federal legislation on California law, Californians and the agency, and to deliberate and provide timely direction to agency staff regarding the agency's position or positions and guidance to Congress on the legislation. Finding four, the board finds that it is not able to meet prior to Congress taking further steps to advance the American Data Protection and Privacy Act or similar legislation. California law could be severely effective, affected. California privacy rights could be compromised and the public interest could be harmed. Finding five, based on these facts and circumstances, insufficient time exists for the board to provide 10 days advance notice of this special meeting and meeting upon shortened notice is necessary and proper. May I thus please have a motion to adopt these factual findings and to determine that one, providing 10 days advance notice pursuant to government code section 11125 would impose a substantial hardship on the board. Two, immediate action is necessary to protect the public interest. And three, it is necessary and proper to proceed with a special meeting pursuant to government code section 11125.4, subdivision C. I so move. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Is there a second to the motion? I will second. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. The motion has been made by Ms. De La Torre and seconded by Ms. Sierra. Thank you very much. Now, are there questions or comments from board members on the pending motion? Okay, thank you very much. Um, in that case, um, is there any public comment from those in the audience on the pending motion? I see no hands raised at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. I'll pause once more for any thoughts that might have occurred to members of the board. And seeing none, I will call the question and ask Ms. Hurtado to conduct a roll call vote. The motion will carry or pass if it receives a unanimous vote or a vote of four to five. Ms. Hurtado, or excuse me, four of at least four members in favor. Ms. Hurtado, would you please perform the roll call vote? Yes. Uh, Ms. Delatori? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. 
Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Chair Urban? Aye. All our ayes. Thank you very much, Ms. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. The uh, required supermajority is achieved and the motion carries by a vote of five to zero. Given that the motion carries, we will continue with the special meeting and move to agenda item two, which is discussion and possible action on proposed federal privacy legislation, including the American Data Protection and Privacy Act and similar legislation. As noted, this discussion and possible action it's under the authority of government code 11125.4 subdivision A2. I now draw your attention to the materials for agenda item two, which includes two short memos from our deputy director of policy and legislation, Maureen Mahoney, um, some letters from the governor of California, um, some attorneys general and the speaker of the uh, California assembly, as well as the current um, version of the ADPPA. I'm delighted now to introduce Maureen Mahoney, our Deputy Director of Policy and Legislation, who will be briefing us today. Um, she joined the California Privacy Protection Agency on May 4th. As Deputy Director of Policy and Legislation, she manages the agency's policy and legislative portfolio, which includes providing technical advice and assistance to us and to the California legislature on privacy legislation and working with authorities in California and other jurisdictions to ensure consistent privacy protections um, per our responsibility under 1798.199.40. Uh, Deputy Director Mahoney joined the agency from Consumer Reports where she worked for nearly a decade on privacy and technology issues, including privacy, data security, data breach notification, right to repair and telemarketing legislation. Before that, she received her PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. I will now hand things over to Deputy Director Mahoney. Please hold your questions until the presentation is complete, unless, of course, Deputy Director say if you prefer otherwise. Um, and um, after we hear from our Deputy Director, we will have some discussion. Thank you, Chairperson, members of the board. I'm here to present an analysis and recommended agency position on HR 8152, the ADPPA, a federal privacy bill that advanced out of the United States House of Representatives Energy and Commerce Committee last week. It provides the right to access, delete, and correct covered data with additional protections for sensitive covered data. There's data minimization language as well. However, it seeks to broadly preempt state comprehensive privacy laws, including the California Consumer Privacy Act, Colorado Privacy Act, and the Connecticut Data Privacy Act as well as data broker registry laws in California, Vermont, and Maine's broadband privacy law. It provides specific carve-outs for some sectoral privacy laws, such as those relating to employee privacy and facial recognition, some specific laws, such as the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, and portions of certain laws, such as the negligent data breach private right of action in the CCPA. However, most protections Californians currently enjoy under the CCPA would likely be preempted, including notably the CCPA's floor for privacy protections, California's ability to strengthen the law in the future, and the agency's ability to protect Californians' privacy rights under the California law. ADPPA would extend certain privacy protections to states where they do not currently exist. However, due to its broad preemption language, ADPPA would likely have significant effects on California law. These could include removing the unique floor for privacy protections created by the CPRA. The CPRA amendments to the CCPA state that it may be amended by the legislature provided that such amendments are consistent with and further the purpose of and intent of the act. This means that currently California enjoys a floor of privacy protections. However, ADPPA, ADPPA seeks to preempt this floor along with other provisions of the CCPA. And this means that Congress could weaken Californians' privacy protections in the future by weakening ADPPA. Second, creating a ceiling on privacy protections for Californians that could be raised only by Congress. This could immediately affect several privacy bills that are advancing through the California legislature in its current session that likely would be preempted by ADPPA. It could prevent future fixes by the California legislature, by California regulation, or by citizen ballot initiative intended to respond to future threats to Californians' privacy. Other states would also not be able to respond on behalf of their citizens. 
And third, substantially affecting the agency's ability to fulfill its responsibilities as mandated by the CPRA. In passing the CPRA, Californians created the agency, invested it with the responsibility and authority to implement and, and enforce the CCPA. And this includes issuing regulations, auditing businesses compliance, and providing administrative enforcement of the CCPA on behalf of Californians. Preempting most of the substantive provisions of the law that created the agency as ADPPA seeks to do could nearly eliminate the agency's ability to carry out its mandate of protecting the privacy of California residents under California law. ADPPA currently purports to provide the agency with the ability to enforce the new federal law. However, the language in the bill still raises significant uncertainties for the agency were to seek to enforce the federal bill as the California legislature may need to take separate action to give the agency the ability to enforce the federal law. And finally, in some cases, ADPPA provisions would provide substantially less protection to Californians than they currently enjoy under the CCPA as amended by CPRA. I'll just provide one example, uh, removing the opt-out of automated decision-making. CPRA directs the agency to develop regulations providing access and opt-out rights with respect to automated decision-making and requiring meaningful information about the logic of such decisions, protections that are not included in the federal bill. Um, and these are crucial components of any privacy and civil rights law. And I'll refer the board to staff's written analysis and the meeting materials for additional examples. So staff has two recommendations. One is to oppose the ADPPA as it advanced out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And the second is to oppose any bill that seeks to preempt the California Consumer Privacy Act or provide substantially weaker protections than the CCPA as amended by CPRA or prevents the agency, California legislature or voters through the ballot initiative from strengthening the privacy protections for Californians in the future or significantly compromises the agency's authority or ability to fulfill its statutory responsibility and mandate on behalf of Californians. Thank you and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Deputy Director. Um, Mahoney, we really appreciate that thorough and yet very well digested um, analysis. Uh, we'll undertake some discussion um, for everyone on the board. Let's undertake some discussion, after which I will appropriate any uh, formulate any appropriate motion or motions. And once we have those on the table, um, the then we will ask for public comment once um, everyone in the audience can um, hear what we have to say um, to begin. Um, I'll go ahead and begin. Thank you again, Deputy Director Mahoney, for briefing this on this crucial issue and for all of the staff who've been working um, to understand the issue um, and to bring it to us. I'm very concerned about the effect that the American Data Pri Protection and Privacy Act and any federal bills with similar preemption provisions would have on Californians and California law. When I say that, I do want to be clear that I certainly commend Congress and the House Energy and Commerce Committee especially for working, I think, very sincerely um, and hard to protect Americans' privacy rights. Californians for 50 years, at least, have enjoyed privacy rights in our constitution and have continuously built on those. And we certainly think that Americans generally um, should have the privacy rights that they deserve. I really appreciate the work that the sponsors of the ADPPA and the other bills have been undertaking. At the same time, it is the agency's role and our responsibility to act as what our implementing legislation, the initiative Proposition 24, calls an independent watchdog to protect Californians' privacy rights. Our law is very clear about our role. At 1798.199.40C of the California Civil Code, the agency shall, through the implementation of this title, protect the fundamental privacy rights of natural persons with respect to the use of their personal information. And in 40L, the agency shall perform all acts necessary and appropriate um, in order to exercise its power, uh, authority, and jurisdiction to balance the goals of strengthening consumer privacy while giving attention to the impact on businesses. Our role is very clear. And our role was set out for us directly by the California voters in the initiative 
statute, Proposition 24, the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020. Given that, I greatly respect Congress's efforts here, but I must say that I support staff's um, recommendation that we do not support it as drafted and that we, and I would say we need to register some very specific concerns. First is timing. Californians have these rights and protections right now, today. Today, Californians can exercise the right to access, the right to opt out, the right to delete today. Right now, today, the Attorney General in California is enforcing rights on behalf of Californians and has been um, for a while. Right now, today, we have a set of regulations promulgated by the Attorney General to give guidance to California consumers and businesses, and the agency is undertaking another round of regulations. I am very concerned about what might happen with um, the implementation of a new federal law with regards to the rights that Californians have today. That brings me to the fact that I feel it is really important to emphasize the point that Deputy Director Mahoney made about the floor on privacy protections that Californians voted for in the initiative process and the ability for California to respond to Californians, both consumers and businesses, um, with regard to future changes. In the initiative process, Californians amended the existing CCPA to require that the any amendments by the California legislature be consistent with and further the purpose of the act. In practical terms, this prevents unnecessary weakening of the law. The federal law does not have this pre protection and it would preempt, that is remove this protection for Californians. Even if the ADPPA itself were the strongest possible law today, it could be weakened in the future. And as a member of this board, I do not feel as though I can support a bill when my role and duty is um, as set forth um, in our initiative um, to protect Californians. And this is such a fundamental um, part of that protection. This is not because I doubt this Congress's intentions. It is because it is a possibility that Californians specifically chose to guard against in the initiative process. And it is because that choice as set forth in Speaker Rendon's letter, to which I all, I direct everyone who's interested, California's protective floor is a response, a direct response to something we have already seen attempted in California and have every reason to believe will be attempted in the future. Similarly, the ceiling. Um, so the federal um, law is currently drafted, a bill is currently drafted, would set a ceiling by preempting California and other states' ability um, to amend the law um, uh, with regard to things covered by the federal law in the future. In my view, it is again the agency's responsibility to stand up for Californians here. 1798.199.40H says that the agency shall monitor relevant developments relating to the protection of personal information, and in particular, the development of information and communication technologies and commercial practices. We actually have that responsibility. And I believe that it is our job not to abdicate that responsibility. Um, now, again, I do appreciate that um, having harmonization is a valuable thing um, for Americans. And again, we have a duty to promote consistent application of privacy laws. I also greatly appreciate the thought that many of the um, people working on the bill in Congress, its drafters have applied. So there are a number of important carve outs from preemption, a number of federal laws that already existed, a number of existing state laws to recognize the innovation in the states, for example, the Biometric Information Privacy Act out of Illinois, one of the bill's drafters state, um, which was a very innovative law and it's carved out of the preemption. This, these these carve-outs recognize innovation in the states and previous um, work at the federal level. California should be fully recognized too. I also want to thank our representative Eshu for proposing an amendment that would 
have the ADPPA continue and be strong, but would allow states to build on it in the future. Um, that I think was a very important um, intervention. And I want to thank our California coalition of representatives who are on the Energy and Commerce Committee, all of whom voted for it. It did not ultimately pass, but I think that was a very important recognition of the fact that while Congress can set a very useful floor and protect privacy rights for all Americans, states need to be able to be responsive. And California in particular, I feel, um, needs to be aware that, uh, about, of its protections via the floor, and we should, um, we should take every step we can to make sure that Californians don't lose that protection. So in the end, I support the conclusions and the memos from staff. Um, I would like to also see room for staff um, uh, to, I would like to see room for staff, excuse me, to oppose on behalf of the agency as needed. I'd also like to see room for staff um, to be able to support um, uh, a different federal bill or a changed federal bill um, that would um, fulfill Californians' interests. For example, would have a true floor and didn't undermine California's rights. Um, it didn't have the kind of ceiling that pre would prevent California or other states from protecting their um, residents' rights in the future. So I'd like to see all of those things. I'd, I'd like to support um, those conclusions, and I'd like to, if we can, um, provide a positive path forward for staff on behalf of the agency. Um, so that's my sort of general take on the issue, um, and I'd like to hear um, from other board members. Could you use your raise your hand either physically or the little icon if you'd like to speak? Thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson and then Ms. De La Torre and then Ms. Yara. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Urban. Um, I, I agree with, with your comment. I think you summed up the situation uh, very well. I'm, I consider myself to be pro-innovation uh, and, and pro-business. Uh, I'm also pro-privacy. And for that reason, I'm glad that Congress is acting in this area to create a federal privacy law. Um, it appears to me that there is a false choice in this bill, however, uh, and that, that um, needs to be called out and has been called out effectively by the governor by the Speaker of the Assembly, um, by Attorney General Bonta and, and nine other attorneys general. And that the false choice is that it, the bill is, the, the federal bill is treating privacy rights as though they are in limited supply. And the strong rights of Californians and others have to be taken away in order to provide weaker rights federally. And, and I think that is, that is a false choice and has been very well articulated uh, by a number of, of the people mentioned, Speaker Rendon, Governor Newsom, Attorney General Bonta, Representative Eshu, and others, that there is an alternative. And the alternative is that we can have both. We can have a federal floor uh, that enables states to continue to innovate uh, in this policy area. Uh, it's been done in a number of areas previously where there is um, uh, continued state latitude to act. The one I'm most familiar with is the Clean Air Act, uh, which I think is a similar set of circumstances where a state in this case, and in that case, California acted first um, and, and the federal government recognized the, the need for the state to continue to act in that, in that regard. As has been pointed out by others, uh, the health insurance uh, uh, portability Act and uh, Graham Leach Bliley also uh, have, have similar federal floors and allow states to continue to act. There's a concept that gets talked about a lot in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere that states are the laboratories of democracy. And really, California's action here has been a catalyst for federal action. Um, California and Colorado and Connecticut, I don't know if there's something about states that start with C. Um, that have acted in this regard have, have really driven this, the, the policy debate here. And one of the things that we don't wanna get lost is that 
technical, technological innovation moves really fast. Um, government does not move as fast as technological innovation, but the states are much better positioned to respond and to continue to keep up with technological innovation than, than the federal government. And I say that as somebody who worked for the federal government for a long time. Um, in this area, California has been active for years um, and you know, has been involved in this act activity for, for many years while the federal government has just been putting its shoes on to, to get involved. And we need to be able to continue to act to protect Californians' rights and to drive forward and adapt to other uh, technological standards uh, or technological innovation. So I agree with your analysis. I agree that we need to, to, to continue to act in accordance with the mandate, mandate of roughly 56% of California voters who wanted strong privacy protections um, and, and uh, voice our opinion and, and support for our California delegation and, and elect other elected leaders uh, acting to protect the rights of Californians in this regard. Uh, I have a few other th thoughts on this, but I'll, I will hold them for later. Wonderful, thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Ms. De La Torre and then Ms. Sierra. Thank you. I want to start by thanking Deputy Director Mahoney for all the work that she has done for us in terms of in terms of analyzing the federal proposal, presenting it to us right now, and just following up with the quick developments in Washington. I'm sure that she has put long hours into this. And I just want to, on behalf of myself, and I'm sure on behalf of all the other members of the board to thank her for the work that she has done already and to um, encourage her to just keep doing what she's doing because she's really valuable for the agency and for us. I couldn't agree more with the words that were expressed by our chairperson, Mrs. Urban, in terms of the mandate that this agency has. And I think that the thoughts that Mr. Thompson share in terms of the false choice narrative are also very important and I have them in mind. There is a couple of things that I also wanted to mention in addition to the ones that have already been mentioned. And uh, if uh, Mrs. Mahogany will allow me, <laughs> they include some questions and I hope that you might um, be able to answer, but it is okay if, if maybe um, we haven't done yet the analysis to have an answer for them. So the first question that I have is, in regards to this um, uh, preemption, right? There's the logic of preemption to me doesn't really align with ensuring that Californians or for that matter, residents of any state enjoy the highest possible um, privacy protections. Um, there's other ways to um, deal with that shared power between the states and federal that will enable that. And they are basically what um, Mr. Thomas just described and Mrs. Irvin referred to. But there is an argument we made in preemption where it can be necessary to preempt a state law when there is misalignment between the state law and the federal law in a way that might either make compliance impossible or maybe confuse um, consumers. As Mr. Uh, Sultani knows well, and I know well, the CPRA was really designed to increase the protections enjoyed by California so as to enable uh, basically a, a equivalence between the protections in California and the protections in Europe. And therefore it's a structure in a way that's fully compatible with the European framework and other international frameworks. So my question for Director Mahogany is whether perhaps the federal law is misaligned with those international frameworks in a way that creates incompatibilities with California. And, and the question, the reasoning for the question is that if, if the federal law is also aligned with these frameworks, in my view, then there is no possibility of incompatibility between the federal law and the state law, right? Like if we are all aligned with these international frameworks. I, I don't see a logic uh, for preemption based on the idea that we are um, creating some form of inconsistency that will um, 
prevent compliance or, or uh, potentially uh, confuse consumers. Uh, have we analyzed this and is there an answer that you could provide, um, Mrs. Mahoney? Uh, that's a very good question. While I can't speak to uh, incompatibility with ADPPA uh, with international frameworks, I do agree that uh, carving out California or allowing for a true floor um, and allowing the states to go further, uh, it you know fully supports interoperability um, because California in its statute um, directs us to um, work towards um, compatibility and interoperability with other jurisdictions um, in other states and internationally. Um, so I would agree that, um, you know, preemption does not necessarily um, provide better protections in terms of interoperability. And, and a follow-up question, and again, um, to the extent that we have done this analysis, it is also clear to me that um, there is a opportunity for California to seek what is called adequacy when it comes to um, cross-border data transfers for, from the European Union and other uh, similar frameworks. Um, in my opinion, California has the strongest path to adequacy that we have ever had in any jurisdiction in this country. Um, it seems to me that the preemption as proposed will significantly limit, if not completely uh, foreclose, the possibility of California seeking adequacy. Is that how you understand the preemption, Mrs. Mahogany, in terms of the possible effects? My understanding that, you know, one of the goals in adopting the CPRA was to work towards adequacy uh, with international models. So I would agree that preemption would raise concerns in that respect. Thank you. And I have a, a final uh, um, comment, and this comes from, you know, having dedicated several years to study um, privacy laws at the state level. Um, as I read the preemption clause, it's, it's really is really broad and it sits on top of a also really broad law. I've never, I don't have a historical reference for something like this in the happening in the US in the area of privacy before. So um, it states, if I am correct, that no state or political subdivision can basically enact it, enact a law that will touch upon anything that's covered by the federal law other than, and then there's, there's exceptions. So the first comment there is that if we're saying no state or political subdivision, we're not only talking about preempting states, we're only also talking about preempting um, counties and preempting cities from enacting any law that will touch upon anything that is covered by this very broad federal law. Is that reading correct, Mrs. Mahoney? Um, I agree that the preemption language is quite broad um, and it could affect additional jurisdictions. You know, I will point out that there are um, certain carve outs for certain, you know, sectoral privacy issues, but I agree with your statement. Thank you so much. Um, I understand again that this is not within the mandate of something that will be done by the agency, but I noticed that there is different organizations in the privacy sphere that have taken positions on the federal law. And I wonder if any of these organizations has done a research to compare the federal law, not only with CPRA, but also with these other multiple state laws here in California and other states or um, local laws that they will de facto be preempting. Is there a list? Has anybody compiled a list of what will be basically found to be um, invalid if this law is enacted as it is, to your knowledge? I don't believe that anyone's done a full comprehensive list, although certainly there have been uh, discussions about um, some of the bills, uh, some of the laws that will be affected. Thank you. I think that um, it seems to me really unwise to broadly preempt laws that nobody has taken the time to identify or analyze 
we can be talking not only about weakening the rights of Californians as it was described by our deputy director and um, which will be within the mandate of the agency, but also multiple other state laws that are in existence, multiple other um, political subdivision laws, laws from cities or counties. And this is particularly concerning to me in an era where we're looking at um, a situation where Roe has been repealed. I think that at the minimum, we should identify the laws that might be currently offering protections for women who are seeking reproductive health care, whether here in California or in other states that may today enjoy protections of laws that can be repealed without, you know, it seems to me, any analysis or thought. And um, for those reasons, in addition to the reasons that Mrs. Urban um, summarized well and Mr. Thomas also summarized really well, I um, fully support the um, recommendation of the staff. Um, I, I wanna have a um, last um, thing that I wanted to share, but I'm gonna reserve that for the end of the conversation. Thank you so much for answering my questions, Mrs. Mahoney. Thank you very much, Ms. De La Torre. And uh, Ms. Sierra, uh, you have a comment and I believe we will be circling back. Oh, after after Mr. Lake. All right, please go ahead, Ms. Sierra. Oh, great, let's see. Thank you so much, um, Chair Urban. And um, I'm not sure my hand is still up, I'll lower that. So um, I, I am very much in agreement um, with the comments and the concerns that have been expressed um, this morning. Um, and I too, um, Ms. Mahoney, thank you so much for your work on this. Um, this is, you know, such a, um, a critical juncture for all of us and um, the information you provided has been extremely helpful. Um, so again, I, I do I share the concerns um, and I too just feel, you know, such a responsibility um, to our state and to, you know, the voters um, who expressed, you know, their will in Proposition 24 and the CPRA. Um, and I too also agree that the provision that provides the floor in California and does expressly provide that California can amend and strengthen um, state privacy laws in the future, that is a, just a critical um, aspect of a CPRA. And um, I just, feel that that in itself, you know, cannot get lost, especially in this area in which we all, you know, in this country are gonna be facing, we're in an area where there's going to be technology innovations has been brought up. And um, I agree with the sentiment and I think it's been proven through our leadership in California on privacy and other issues that the states are in the best position to really react and address um, to changes in technology. And we are going to be able to be um, far more nimble um, in that area. And so, you know, those reasons to me um, really impact you know, my feeling of support, fully support of the um, staff's recommendations in this area. And, you know, the other um, point I just wanted to make is that, um, I am also concerned about um, any provisions that are going to cause uncertainty with respect to the enforcement that our agency and the states um, are really responsible and, and in a good position um, to enforce as regulators in this area. And um, having been a civil prosecutor in the past at the California Department of Justice, you know, I just have a real concern that to the extent that there are um, the enforcement provisions and the enforcement authority for the states and our agency with respect to either investigations or bringing actions, if those are weakened or just if there are issues of um, not as much clarity or confusion about those, that that can really weaken our effectiveness um, as an agency whether it's enforcing federal law or state law. 
And um, ultimately that would really be to the detriment of consumers. So I'm really concerned about um, those areas as well. So um, with that, again, I echo the um, concerns that have been expressed. Um, I really do, I think, um, uh, Mr. Thompson's point about the false choice, I fully agree with that. You know, that there is room for federal legislation. I think this work is so important, um, but at the same time, allowing the states to be able to address what is going to be um, very important for its residents. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sierra. Um, Mr. Lay, you had your hand up. You had your hand down. Is your hand up? Yes, my hand is up. Oh, please go. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'm not going to say too much. I, I believe, you know, Chair Urban and the rest of the board members have already articulated many of the points um, I wanted to make here. Um, you know, I very much support the ADPBPA as a floor, not a ceiling uh, for privacy rights. And I think based on the discussions we've had here today, you know, our mandate and the recommendations of the staff, you know, I'm inclined to you know, oppose the ADPBA unless it is amended in such a way that it preserves the rights of Californians that we currently have under the CPR that we have today. Um, and also in a way that preserves the right for California to legislate to, to protect kids' privacy, um, you know, privacy around reproductive health care or, or you know, uh, efforts to limit biometric surveillance and things like that. Um, I think staff have covered in their memo many of the ways that the ADPPA would uh, not quite live up to the, the standards that the CPRA already has given Californians. Um, you know, I want to highlight in particular that, you know, preemption would mean that Californians no longer have the right to, to opt out of automated decision making. Um, you know, something that, you know, our subcommittee has been working on or to get meaningful information uh, when an automated system profiles them uh, or makes a high stakes decision around who has access to jobs, health care, credit, housing. Uh, you name it. I think, I think California's law covers more service providers, you know, such as those processing data for government entities. Um, I think the CCPA, with help of the AG, clearly covers uh, inferences made around us uh, that the ADPPA does not protect as, as clearly. Um, you know, it requires, it allows the, the agency to do audits um, and requires impact assessments for more types of businesses whose processing presents a significant risk to our privacy. And also, you know, it gives California the ability to enforce this law where the FTC may not have the resources um, or the attention to focus on California. Um, so while I am excited about the prospect of a national privacy law, I, I believe it does not need to come at the expense of the privacy rights we have here in California. So I believe as a board member, you know, it's, it's my responsibility to protect and strengthen California's uh, privacy rights. And um, so I think I, 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 I'm inclined to join with the governor, the attorney general, the speaker of the house to, to voice concern around the preemption in the ADPBA. Um, and, and we'll likely vote to oppose it uh, unless amended. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. I want to briefly um, circle back in response to some comments that my fellow board members made and I'm fully in agreement with I think everything that I've heard here today. I would also like to emphasize Mr. Thompson's point about a false choice. And I would like to emphasize Ms. De La Torre's point, which I would sum up as about unintended consequences. When a change this substantial is made to preempt so broadly what states, counties, cities, other jurisdictions um, are doing, that will have very, very um, broad reaching effects, some of which will be very specific. Ms. De La Torre mentioned women seeking reproductive health care. Um, there may be children seeking to get away from an abusive situation. There may be um, you know, any number of specific scenarios that we may not have thought of right now this second, and that Congress has not thought of right now this second, that this could affect. Uh, and so, well, again, I really do support what Congress is generally doing here. I worry greatly about the breadth of the preemption and how far it would end up reaching. And I'm concerned that even with the things that we've identified today, we haven't been able to um, do a full accounting as Ms. De La Torre suggested 
Um, and of course, we don't know exactly what the future holds. So I would hope that Congress would be willing to future proof its law um, and to allow states um, to act on behalf of their residents. All right, after listening, um, well, we actually, I believe that Ms. De La Torre may have had another point and possibly Mr. Thompson, did you wanna circle back? Please raise your hand if you would like. Yes, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, you're still on mute. Thank you. I just wanted to circle back um, to um, suggest that one of the course of actions that the agency uh, could take is um, related to promoting awareness. And this is within our mandate under California Civil Code 1798-199-40B, no, D, um, is the mandate of the agency to promote public awareness and understanding of the risks, rules, responsibilities, safeguards, and rights in relation to the collection, use, sale, and disclosure of personal information, including the rights of minors. I do not read this mandate as limited to CCPA and CPRA. And I think it's really important for us to consider, even though we still have limited staff and limited resources, whether it should be a priority of the agency moving forward to work on a public awareness campaign so that the public can understand the rights that they currently have, as Mrs. Urban pointed right now, um, because it is important for them to be aware of those rights in order for them to be, um, to be understanding what will be the consequences of an enactment of a law that preempts those rights at the federal level. And again, I understand that we have limited resources. Mr. Sultani has just you know, done an amazing job um, himself, just um, supporting so many different initiatives. And we have the rulemaking, which requires a lot of resources. But I think at this point, it's wise to pause for a second and think if rulemaking should be our top um, priority in terms of enforcement, or maybe there is room to make public awareness also a top priority at this point. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, Mr. Lay, I believe you are on the public awareness subcommittee. Yeah, um, I, yeah I just want to note that you know, that is something that's come up in a public awareness subcommittee. We actually have, uh, Mr. Sultani has been actually great in getting us resources to, to do a public awareness campaign. Um, and, you know, that is definitely is in the works to, to inform Californians about the rights they have. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if now is the right time to maybe share some more about that. But just to let you know, it's it's, it's in the books. There's budget for it. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully that will be rolling out in the next uh, in short. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, that is, I'm heartened to hear that um, as well. And uh, Mr. Thompson? Thank you. I was going to ask Ms. Mahoney to um, elaborate on a point that was in her memorandum. Um, and Because I think it's helpful to illustrate what the actual effects of, of this proposed legislation could be on, on the rights that people have in the state of California currently. Uh, in my experience and observation, people want privacy protection. That is something that they value. Um, and it is the job of, of government, us and others, to make the barriers to them getting those privacy or securing their privacy protections if they so choose to make sure the barriers are not inordinately high. And one of the things that jumped out to me, Ms. Mahoney, in your memorandum, is on page three, uh, the section about adding a requirement to authenticate global opt-out requests. I was wondering if you could briefly describe the difference between uh, what a person who is under California's current law would experience versus this proposed law. 
Sure. So as you noted, one of the most important things with respect to any privacy law is making sure that consumers can easily take advantage of those rights. And a key part of that um, in California, which is currently required by regulation as added to the statute by Proposition 24, is requiring businesses to honor uh, browser privacy controls as a global opt-out so that consumers don't have to go to hundreds, if not thousands, of different sites one by one in order to exercise their preferences. Um, and in California, the statute has um, and regulations have also been designed to not add any unnecessary friction in that process. For example, you know, not allowing businesses to um, pummel consumers with authentication or verification requests when they do that. So that would subvert the intent of providing smooth opt-out if your inbox is filling up um, with requests to confirm that you actually wanted to do that. Um, and new language that has been put into the ADPPA uh, could potentially compromise that and, and undermine um, kind of the smooth operation of a global opt-out. Thank you. I mean, so in my words, that would be, um, if I signal that I want to opt out, I should not be repeatedly asked, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> Can you please prove you're Chris Thompson? Um, and those are, those are the differences in what people in California currently uh, experience versus what would be the experience potentially under the federal bill is the, the repeated uh, request to verify that, that you actually do want the privacy protections you indicated you wanted and that you are who you say you are. Um, the other, other quick point I wanted to make, obviously we are most familiar with and are charged with the privacy protections of consumers in the state of California. Um, and you included in the packet, the letter from the, uh, I think it's 10 attorneys general, um, but wanted to just highlight that this is not only about California, um, it is about other states as well. And the, the ability of other states to act in this area and to protect the states that already have acted in this area um, and I was, it was, it's gratifying to see that the attorneys general in, in California, Connecticut, Illinois, Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, and Washington state are all voicing a similar view. Um, so I would repeat, we are charged with protection of privacy rights in California, but this is about more than just California. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Um, so I certainly uh, don't want to cut off discussion, but I will go ahead and pause for a moment um, to let you know, as I've been listening and having read the materials, um, what I think might be a model to start with in terms of how we might um, offer a position and provide direction and authority to staff. Um, I'll first say that Ms. De La Torre's point about public awareness, um, I think that's something that we, by affirmation, you know, could all nod and say, yay, yes, we think that's a great idea. Um, but with regards to um, taking positions and providing sufficient authority, um, I suggest that we consider three motions. And we could combine them. I just find it mentally easier to... Uh, make sure we have our points um, very, very clear for staff separately. So um, I suggest that I first request a motion to approve agency staff's recommendation to oppose the American Data Privacy Protection Act as currently drafted. And I will get to what might happen if it would change. And then I suggest that second, I would request a motion um, to approve agency staff's recommendation to oppose any federal bill that seeks um, to um, do the things that are listed in Ms. Mahoney's memo, which is uh, preempt the California Consumer Privacy Act, provide substantially weaker protections than the CCPA as amended by the CPRA, prevents the agency, California legislatures, or voters through the ballot initiative from strengthening privacy protections for Californians in the future. Um, I might add, or generally responding to technological social and business changes. Um, or significantly compromises the agency's authority or ability to fulfill its statutory responsibilities and mandate on behalf of Californians. And I think that we could um, um, 
uh, sort of have as an introduction that this would be in staff's judgment so that they have the ability to um, respond um, as things change if they do. And then in terms of my desire, and I think others desire, um, to be clear uh, that we do um, appreciate federal work that would protect privacy rights for all Americans without compromising states' ability to act, I might suggest having a motion um, to authorize agency staff to support a federal bill that does X, Y, or Z in their judgment. And I would suggest that doesn't broadly preempt our act or that in general does create a true floor for privacy protection that protects Californians' current rights and that California and other states could build on in the future. And we could work on the wording, um, but in general, um, those would be the sort of three points that I suggest um, that, we, that we hit when authorizing staff um, and giving them some guidance. And do we have any comments on that sort of formulation? Did I miss anything? Does that make sense? That makes sense. I think what you described, sorry, go ahead, Ms. De La Torre. No, go ahead. I, I was just saying that it makes sense to me. Yeah, it makes sense to me as well, the, the elements you, you described, and I would defer to your judgment on whether it's one or, or multiple motions. Thank you, Mr. Thompson and Ms. De La Torre. Anyone else? All right, then I will try to put those into motion language. And once we have them on the table, we will take public comment. So the public has all the information um, for public comment. First, may I have a motion to approve agency staff's recommendation to oppose the American Data Privacy Protection Act as currently drafted? I'll, I'll still move. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. The motion is made by Mr. Lay and seconded by Mr. Thompson. Second, may I have a motion to approve agency staff's recommendation to oppose any federal bill that in agency staff's judgment seeks to broadly preempt the California Consumer Privacy Act or provide substantially weaker protections than the California Consumer Privacy Act as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act, or prevents the agency, the California legislature, or voters through the ballot initiative from strengthening privacy protections for Californians in the future, or generally responding to technological, social, or business change, or significantly compromises the agency's authority or ability to fulfill its statutory responsibilities and mandate on behalf of Californians. I will so move. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Do I have a second? Uh, I'll second. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I have a motion from Ms. Sierra and a second from Ms. De La Torre. Third, may I have a motion to approve agency staff, excuse me, let me start over. Third, I have to think it through. May I, Third, may I have a motion to authorize agency staff to support any federal bill that does not in staff's judgment preempt the California Privacy Protection Act of 2018 as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act in 2020, or that in general creates a true floor for privacy protection that protects Californians' current rights and that California and other states could build on in the future. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, I have a motion from Mr. Thompson and a second from Ms. Sierra. So those motions are now on the table. Um, and I would like to um, ask uh, for public comment. And just to remind everyone of the process, Please use the raise your hand function and our moderator, Ms. Hurtado, will call on you. She needs to call on you and unmute you, um, just so you know. So she'll let you know when you can talk. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. In addition, I need to please remind everyone that is required by the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act, 
our discussion is limited to this agenda item. Other topics, for example, the current rulemaking are not proper topics for discussion. And this is always important. It's especially important for a special meeting. And in addition, as a, remember, as a reminder, the board generally really can only listen and not respond directly. It may seem as though we are being unresponsive, but we do not intend this and we are listening. Um, so with that, is there any public comment from the audience on this item of these motions? Um, yes, and I just promoted him over and he went away. I'm here. Okay, we'll go to the, oh, there you are. Uh, Mr., um, I don't wanna mess up your last name. Um, so you now have three minutes and your time starts now. Thank you. Good morning, chair and members. George Brampadu speaking on behalf of ACLU California Action. We strongly oppose the ADPP, ADPPA's inclusion of a broad preemption clause. Any federal privacy law should serve as a floor, providing baseline protections for all Americans, not as a ceiling limiting stronger state laws. The ADPPA's preemption clause will not just constrain California's ability to protect privacy rights going forward, but will also wreak havoc on all levels of existing state privacy protections. As noted by Deputy Director Mahoney, the ADPPA would erase much of this agency's regulations and authority, strike out vital components of the California Consumer Privacy Act and other laws passed by our legislature, override crucial portions of the California Privacy Rights Act passed directly by Californians, and undermine our Constitution's guarantee of an inalienable right to privacy. We strongly urge the agency to voice concerns about the ADPPA's preemption clause directly to Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Paramthu. Um, Ms. Hurtado, do we have further public comment? Uh, yes, we do. One moment, please. Uh, Mr. Weber, you are next uh, to speak. I will be moving you over. Be just one moment. The next speaker is Barry Weber. Thank you. And I will add one more um, piece of information for speakers, which is that you're welcome to turn on your camera or not. I forgot to mention that. It's up to you if you are participating via the Zoom platform. Uh, Mr. Weber. Okay, Mr. Weber, uh, you may unmute yourself at any time. You have three minutes and your time starts now. Thank you. This is Barry Weber from Assured SPC. We're a uh, consulting organization that helps other organizations implement sensible privacy and data security programs. So I really appreciate this meeting. It's a very timely and support everything that has been said in this, uh, in this meeting. I, it is uh, just... I think the work that the CPPA does is, is incredibly good. Uh, the one thing I wanted to mention, which was I thought very innovative, was the discussion associated with awareness campaigns. And it struck me that I know that the, uh, the Attorney General's Office in Colorado also has funds for awareness campaigns. And just as a suggestion, it may be an interesting thing to do to consider collaborating across states in a message not only to the individual states, but to the population as a general about privacy and, and a useful way of communicating the issues that the CPPA is raising at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Weber. Um, Ms. Hurtado? Uh, yes, one moment. Our next speaker is Thomas Gerhardt. Mr. Gerhardt, one moment while I move you over. Just be one moment. Okay. Oh, there he is. Okay, Mr. Gerhardt, you have three minutes to speak. 
I just saw him move over. Okay, for whatever reason, it's not allowing me to move him over. I will allow him to talk. Uh, this will not allow you to um, turn your camera on, Mr. Uh, Gerhardt, but you, you are able to speak. You may speak now. You have three minutes. Hello, my name is Thomas Gerhardt. I'm just a concerned citizen on the matter. Um, I really appreciate what uh, the board is doing. Um, I wanted to go on record and say, uh, you know, I, I like the idea of the cross state line collaboration. Um, I feel like uh, not only is there the opportunity there for the uh, public interest camp or the, the, the informational campaigns, um, but there may be some alternatives or some uh, ability to uh, create some sort of like a petition for citizens to sign. Um, and then, you know, on the state levels, work with our state legislators uh, in uh, the House of Representatives to maybe build some opposition uh, beyond just, you know, taking a position uh, opposing a bill and talk to them about what we'd like to see in it. Um, and especially, uh, I, I think it would add a little bit more strength behind uh, what we're doing or what you're doing. Uh, for our privacy laws and trying to protect them uh, from this, if you know us in Colorado, um, and I, I've already forgotten the third state that starts with a C. But if we all um, kind of came together and said, "Hey, look, we have these many citizens who have signed this petition. It could be a, a joint petition that we sign where you specify what state you're from. Um, this is our position on it. We don't want to see our privacy laws uh, undermined." Um, you can build up a floor for the states who don't have privacy laws, but you shouldn't limit the states that do. Uh, if you could push forward these changes, in addition to taking your position uh, opposing the ADPPA. Uh, thank you very much for the time and thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Gerhardt. Ms. Hurtado? Okay, our next speaker is Jody Masters Gonzalez. just one moment. You know, Ms. Furtado, I was just noticing, I think Mr. Weber is still promoted. Maybe was he? I, I'm, I, I'm, that's my issue. I can't get him back over there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Weber, that uh, you're, you're still promoted, but uh, we, we did appreciate your comment. Okay, Jody Masters Gonzalez, we're just waiting for her to move over. Good morning, are you able to hear me? Yes, you uh, are able, yes, we can hear you, your time starts now. Great. Um, I just want to say thank you very much to the California Privacy Protection Agency Board for holding this special meeting and uh, inviting us to speak. I uh, am a researcher at AI, um, ethics, algorithmic risk, public policy is where my domain of research and practice lies. I'm also a fellow and certified um, auditor of independent AI systems, which is actually a governance oversight and accountability framework. And um, in this area, uh, I strongly oppose um, the federal legislation, in particular, the components that remove um, protection from opting out of the automated decision making. Um, as um, some of you know, or may not, fully aware that there are the number of bills and legislation that's been proposed across the board um, uh, in the last 12 months related to these types of systems. It's, it's, it's uh, the volume is unreal, unre it's uh, so much. 
And we absolutely um, automated decision making is 100% what is here, what is coming with full force. And we have to uh, do everything we can to um, protect our citizens and uh, their rights and their ability to opt out as well as um, uh, you know, other associated capabilities, but opting out for sure you know, is a, is a really good first step and we have to protect that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Masters Gonzalez. Ms. Hurtado, are there, is there further public comment? Uh, yes, the next commenter is Haley Sukiyama. Okay, Ms. Sukiyama, I'm just gonna allow you to talk. That means that your camera won't be available, but you can um, speak freely. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. Hi, I'm Haley Tsukiyama. I'm senior legislative activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I just um, really want to thank you all for um, talking about this subject today. And we really appreciate the agency's work here. Um, we, uh, EFF is not in opposition to this bill, but we have serious concerns which we have communicated to Congress. Uh, we've written letters and blog posts, uh, particularly around the issue of preemption, um, which is one of our three major issues with the bill. Um, I just, uh, you know, I do want to echo what many of you have said, which is that, um, you know, we support um, the, the staff conclusions that this would broadly preempt many laws uh, in, in California um, and that, uh, you know, we, we have a firm position as an organization not to, not to let federal laws roll back privacy protections we have currently on the books in the states. Um, you know, obviously this is a California agency, but this is a national issue. Uh, as Ms. Mahoney mentioned, you know, we're really looking at laws being rolled back, uh, broadband privacy laws, um, uh, genetic information privacy laws being rolled back across the country. Um, and then, of course, uh, freezing um, states from being able to act in the future. That's really concerning to us. Um, there is, There are, of course, privacy law models for floor not ceiling um, that health information privacy, uh, sorry, health information portability and accountability act is a floor not a ceiling. Uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act is a floor not a ceiling. We have mentioned this to Congress and um, we're really glad to see you all speak up. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is going to be uh, Alistair McTaggart. Uh, Mr. McTaggart, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, uh, Chair Urban and uh, the rest of the board. Uh, my name is Alistair McTaggart, and I'm the founder of Californians for Consumer Privacy. Um, and our organization spearheaded efforts, along with many other uh, speaker groups today, um, to help establish the California Consumer Privacy Act and then the California Privacy Rights Act, which was Prop 24. And I'd like to voice strong support for the uh, for the staff recommendation contained in the memos and the, and the, and the board votes today. Um, uh, and generally for support for any proposals which seek to protect uh, the, the law from, from being preempted. Um, I'd like to commend the work of Deputy Director Dr. Mahoney uh, and thank the governor and uh, Speaker Rendon and the Attorney General for their strong advocacy uh, against the subject of, of, of preemption. You know, there's a lot to like in ADPPA for much of America, but it would represent a giant step backwards for Californians in many really important areas, um, including uh, government surveillance and including, uh, uh, you know, auditing and including uh, 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 many other many, many other areas. And so, you know, one of the speakers talked about um, a, a citizen peti petition. We, we had a citizen petition, which 9.4 million Californians voted for. And so, I would urge the board to do whatever it takes to get the message out. You have a lot of financial resources and, and the statute specifically instructs the board and, and the agency to uh, 
uh, engage in public awareness around risks to privacy. This is a vital risk to the privacy of Californians today. And I think you have absolutely statutory authority to expend resources uh, and, and, and really raise the alarm that this proposal, uh, which is purported to be stronger than California, is actually massively weaker in many areas and would, would really hurt the uh, hard-won privacy rights of Californians. Thank you for your time. And thank you again for all your work. Uh, all the board members I know work incredibly hard on in this, uh, as well as Director Ashkan and uh, Deputy Director Mahoney and the rest of the staff. So I want to thank everybody. And that's my comment. Thank you very much, Mr. McTaggart. Ms. Hurtado, do we have further public comment? Uh, yes, we do. The next public comment is going to be, uh, I'm assuming it's Washington People's Privacy. Uh, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, uh, we can. Cool. My name is Maya Morales. I'm an organizer zooming in from Washington State, and I would like to thank you all so much for your work on data privacy. Um, after working to pass several municipal ballot initiatives with a group of other organizers in 2021, um, including a privacy protecting law, I founded an organizing entity called Washington People's Privacy here with sites on passing strong data privacy laws and restrictions on surveillance in both Washington state and possibly other states. Organizers here worked so hard to stop a weak bill from passing in our state. And not only do Washington residents value privacy, the good majority of us also value the right to access abortion and gender affirming health care, the right to public assembly and environmental and climate justice work. These are all activities under threat in our nation right now. When I learned that the ADPPA would preempt stronger laws, I immediately realized that both California and Washington state would be key players. And we all dug into a deep reading of the bill with other um, Washington privacy organizers. People all over the country want the right to protect our privacy via the democratic process. And in an ever evolving landscape of surveillance threats and data harms that are continually growing and changing, states, counties, and municipalities must be able to meet the needs of our residents. It's important to be crystal clear about who preemption serves and who it harms. Preemption privileges the needs of corporations over the needs of people. So the decision that California will make on preemption, whether um, to advocate for a singular exemption for its own state or whether to defend the rights of all states in this moment, in solidarity with people all over this nation, it really hits to the core of our democracy and the rights and liberties that we all hold valuable. Tech and data harms have developed far faster than our laws have. And the idea of preempting future laws, even if there are a few carve outs in that preemption is deeply unwise. It's important to note that this is unfavored. It is unfavored and marginalized communities that will of course take the brunt of preemptive laws. Preemption will prevent states, counties and municipalities all over this nation from using the law to further protect immigrants of color LGBTQIA folks, Black and Indigenous and people of color who are over-targeted by surveillance, and poor and houseless individuals, and even those with issues of language and disability access that are not addressed by the ADPPA. I really appreciate the comments of Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson regarding the gravity of this board's decision, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Morales. Ms. Hurtado, do we have further public comment? Uh, yes, our next speaker is John. John, you have been unmuted. You now may speak. You have three minutes. It begins now. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. And thank you for all the work you've been doing on this issue. And in particular to uh, Ms. Mahoney for her extraordinary uh, efforts. I'm John Pincus a technologist and entrepreneur. I, I lived in California for years and may well move back there in the future, but currently live in Bellevue, Washington. I fully support the first two motions and would ask you to strengthen the third to authorize agency staff to support a federal bill that doesn't preempt CPRA and that in general creates a floor that California and other states can build on in the future. So replace the or with an and. As you highlight, the preemption clause not only eliminates existing state laws like CRPA and local laws like Seattle's broadband privacy ordinance, it also puts a ceiling on these future protections. Washington's AG opposes preemption, and so do grassroots activists across the state, including Washington people's privacy. As Ms. Delatore highlighted, the threats to privacy in a post-Roe world really emphasize what's at stake. 
Here's how Kim Clark of Seattle nonprofit Legal Voices described ADPPA in a Spokane Spokesman Review article earlier this week. This bill, at least from the perspective of pregnant people, it really doesn't do much. ADPPA's protection would prevent, prevent states like ours who do value privacy from doing more, from providing stronger protections. And as Ms. Morales pointed out, the same loopholes and exemptions in ADPPA that make it easy for so-called crisis pregnant centers to stare, share data with vigilantes and red state law enforcement also allow targeting of immigrants, LGBTQ plus people, unhoused people, people receiving state benefits, all the other groups who are most impacted by surveillance and data abuse. Preemption stops our states from protecting them as well. Again, I agree with what everybody has said. ADPBA does have some very good features and hopefully at least some of these problems will be fixed as before it hits the floor. Even so, even if all the issues, CCPA and EFF and ACLU and Washington People's Privacy and others have identified with ADPPA were somehow magically addressed, preemption would still be a, pro a problem. Technology changes quickly. And as Chris Thompson uh, quoted Louis Brandeis, states are the laboratories of democracy. As a tech leader, California is particularly well-placed to help here, as is Washington. So thank you again for fighting for privacy seconds. rights for people in California and all across the country. Thank you very much, Mr. Pincus. Ms. Hurtado, is there any further public comment? Uh, yes, we have one more speaker, John Leibowitz. Mr. Leibowitz, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Your time starts now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And I wanna thank uh, everybody who has spoken and of course everybody um, uh, uh, on the panel, um, uh, you know, we all share uh, the same goal. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the former uh, FTC chair appointed by President Obama. And uh, uh, and uh, when, I, uh, when I worked at the FTC, we brought major cases against Google, Google and Facebook for not honoring their privacy commitments. We called for a strong federal law in 2012 that would give all consumers um, uh, control, all Americans more control over their data. I don't have a client here. I'm just speaking on behalf of myself and really for stronger uh, protections for all Americans. So uh, Mr. Thompson said that California, and is absolutely right, and Mr. Pinkus said this too, um, uh, is a laboratory for democracy. Um, it, it certainly is, and you passed the first privacy law, and that's critically important. We wouldn't be moving federally, I suspect, um, uh, or the federal or the Congress wouldn't be moving if it wasn't for the California law in part. Um, but the House bill, I believe, though certainly not perfect, is far stronger than existing California law. And let me let me tell you why I believe that. So first of all, it has greater civil rights protections, and I think that's why that is why uh, a lot of the civil rights groups uh, support, uh, as well as privacy groups, of course, uh, support uh, the federal legislation. Second, it has greater protection for kids. It would force Google, Facebook, uh, and other large data collectors uh, to stop the kind of willful blindness they've engaged in um, that allows them to advertise to kids uh, in ways that would be illegal if they knew that they were advertising to kids. They'll have to combine databases. Third, it has a private right of action, which California only has for a breach. Uh, and it has a private right of action for a violation. That's why many businesses oppose the legislation. And most importantly, it has stronger privacy protections. Data minimization, a universal opt-out potential um, uh, for consumers uh, authorized by FTC rulemaking. More resources for the FTC and finding authority for the FTC, which is enormously important. If a federal law passes, um, Californians uh, will immediately have greater privacy protections. And if it fails, um, the biggest winners- 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Um, are uh, uh, the cyberazzi um, who hoover up all of our data. Data moves in interstate commerce. We need a national solution, um, but, uh, uh, but we'll only have a robust federal law if everyone makes some sacrifices, uh, including businesses, including states. Uh, and so um, uh, I would urge you um, to change these recommendations from oppose uh, PPA to work more, uh, to work to make them better. And with that, um, I will stop speaking and thank you so much for. Uh... Thank you very much, Mr. Leibowitz. 
Ms. Hurtado, do we have any further public comment? Uh, that was the last public comment for right now. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, our many thanks uh, to everyone who took the time to call in and give us their thoughts today. They were all um, very valuable. I will first pause and ask if the board has further um, commentary before we take up the motions. Yes, Ms. De La Torre. I will appreciate an opportunity to discuss the suggestion that was made by one of the commenters for the third motion to potentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. Um, all right, um, thank you, um, Ms. De La Torre. Why don't we start with that? Uh, so what we have on the table uh, is a motion that gives um, staff discretion to support any federal bill that uh, in staff's judgment doesn't broadly preempt the California Privacy Protection Act of 2018 as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, or that in general creates a true floor for privacy protection that protects Californians' current rights and that California and other states could build on in the future. Mr. Pincus's suggested amendment would be to change or to and so that the motion um, gives staff authorization um, to support a federal bill that doesn't preempt uh, in their judgment broadly and that creates a true floor. Um, my own view of this is that I very much appreciate the thought and the friendly amendment. I, I think it's a friendly amendment um, from Mr. Pincus. I think that I would prefer to go with more discretion for staff just to give them room to maneuver. Um, but I certainly endorse the, um, the sort of underlying um, substantive animation of Mr. Pincus's comment. That's my initial thought. Um, are there other thoughts um, from board members? Uh, my thoughts are aligned with the thoughts expressed by Chairman Urban. I think it's important to enable staff to have flexibility, given that this is an area where things are quickly developing. At the same time, I think it's important, even if it's not part of the motion itself, to express support for the idea that was mentioned by several commenters of collaborating with other states or with organizations that seek to um, raise awareness. And have in mind that this law does not only affect the CPRA and California, but all states, all counties, and all municipalities across the US. Um, with that, I'm comfortable with voting in favor of the motion as presented. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. In that case, what I propose is that we um, go through the motions and vote, and then we do our two affirmations. One from earlier, which I did get nods from everyone, but I think that it would be helpful to do after we've had the chance to hear from the public as well with regards to public awareness. And then we can see if there's affirmation um, uh, to give the staff the board's sense of the importance of both of those components of the motion and the importance of this issue, not just for California, but for other states, um, municipalities, and counties. Does that capture what you are thinking, Ms. De La Torre? Please feel free to amend too. Yes, thank you, that's perfect. Okay. All right, so um, with that, um, we have on the table uh, three motions. And uh, first I will request, or excuse me, first I will ask for a vote on a motion duly seconded to approve agency staff's recommendation to oppose the American Data Privacy Protection Act as currently drafted. Ms. Hurtado, could you please um, call the roll call vote? Uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Delatore? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Chair Urban? Aye. You have five ayes and zero nays. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. The motion passes with a vote of five to zero. Second, I will please vote on a motion to approve agency staff's recommendation 
to oppose any federal bill that in agency staff's judgment seeks to broadly preempt the California Consumer Privacy Act or provide substantially weaker protections than the CCPA as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act or prevents the agency, the California legislature, or voters through the ballot initiative from strengthening privacy protections for Californians in the future or responding to technological, social, or business changes, or significantly compromises the agency's authority or ability to fulfill its statutory responsibility and mandate on behalf of Californians. This motion has been made and duly seconded. Ms. Hurtado, could you please call the roll call vote? Uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Dilatori? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Chair Urban? Aye. Uh, there were five ayes and zero nays. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. The motion passes with the vote of five to zero. Third, I ask the board to vote on the motion to authorize agency staff to support federal bill. Any, excuse me, let me start over just so I have it exactly right in the transcript. Um, third, I ask the board to vote on a motion to support, sorry, I think I've been talking too much. I'm just gonna pause for one second and then I'm gonna start over. Hmm. Third, I ask the board to please vote on a motion to authorize the agency staff to support any federal bill that does not, in the agency staff's judgment, broadly preempt the California Privacy Protection Act of 2018 as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, or that, in general, creates a true floor for privacy protection that protects Californians' current rights and that California and other states could build on in the future. This motion has been made and duly seconded. Um, Ms. Hurtado, could you please conduct the roll call vote? Uh, yes, Ms. Delatori? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Chair Urban? Aye. Five ayes and zero nays. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado, and thank you to the board. The motion carries with a vote of five to zero. Now we will take up the affirmations. I'd actually like to start with the affirmation Ms. De La Torre spoke of most recently um, that uh, in response to our public commenter, Mr. Pincus, since we just did that motion. Um, Mr. Pincus pointed out that we have an or in our motion. Um, so in theory, um, staff could support a bill that did one of those two things rather than both of those two things. Um, and he also, as other speakers did, mentioned the importance of other states' um, ability to protect their residents also being protected. With that, um, I suggest that the board, um, by affirmation, um, offer its sense and guidance to staff um, to, um, uh, to um, uh, be aware that both of those components of the motion are important and both should be um, uh, both should be um, considered carefully and that the, the staff also consider the effect um, of um, anything that Congress is doing on Californians and how it would affect other states. And as Ms. De La Torre pointed out, also counties and municipalities. Um, this we can do with a general, I think, nodding of heads. Um, if people agree, um, the staff will, I think will have the information they need to move forward. Thank you very much. Um, I see nods from everyone. Um, and so um, staff, please let us know if you have any further questions, um, but if you feel like you have good direction and um, Deputy Director Mahoney is nodding, um, we will move forward with that. Um, second, um, Ms. De La Torre introduced um, a topic um, to the board discussion that I think was generally supported um, by the board and got a lot of support as well in public comments, uh, which is to um, uh, um, uh, give staff the sense that we agree with suggestions um, to invest in public awareness efforts in order for Californians to understand the rights that they have and for everyone to understand um, how 
uh, this particular federal bill or other laws might affect those. Did I get that summarized okay? Okay, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. And Mr. Lay also um, spoke up um, as one of the members of the Public Awareness um, Subcommittee. Did I cover everything from your point of view? Wonderful. All right, um, then again, by affirmation, if we can give staff our sense on that, um, please just nod. Great, wonderful. Um, I have nods from all of the board members and ask that the staff please um, take that into account. Thank you very much. Uh, given that, um, that is the end of uh, the business that I have for this agenda item. But before we leave, I want to be sure that board members have an opportunity to say anything else that they um, have not yet had the chance to say on this agenda item. Yes, Ms. De La Torre. I just quickly wanted to thank the other board members for their contributions to this discussion. I think it has been really helpful to hear not only my voice, but the voices of the other board members and, and the commenters. And I just wanted to stress that this is understanding the mandate of the agency as so well was summarized by Mrs. Urban. And the fact that we're facing a false choice, as Mr. Thompson uh, mentioned, the uncertainties around enforcement that could be brought by a federal law that Mrs. Sierra mentioned, and all of the different aspects that were highlighted by Mr. Lee, and in particular, those that relate to automated decision-making, which is a fast evolving field. Um, I um, am really satisfied that we came to where we are, which is uh, unanimous support for um, the staff position. And the final thing is I want to highlight, and I understand that the mandate of the agency is limited to California, but I want to highlight that we all have families that live in other states, that we have kids that go to college in other states. So the idea of collaboration with other states and to consider the aspects in terms of preemption for municipalities, there could be today a law in Atlanta provided limited by needed uh, privacy protections for women seeking reproductive health care in that state. And that law can be preempted. I think that um, it is the job of the, um, of the um, federal legislature to consider those aspects and analyze them uh, before acting. So um, just summarizing, just I was, I was um, my intent was just to thank the other board members, um, kind of summarize all of the contributions, and um, thank the staff for the work that um, they have done so far. Thank, thank you. you very much, Ms. De La Torre. Other final comments? Uh, yes, Mr. Sultani. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. Um, I just wanted to thank, take a moment to thank the board for their strong and vocal support of this incredibly important and existential issue that affects, as mentioned, not just Californians' privacy, but the privacy of the entire country. As indicated in the comments by the board and the public, privacy is an incredibly complicated issue. And while I appreciate suggestions by advocates and others on how the ADPA may be stronger than the California law, I assure you that in my and staff's expert opinion, it is not. Not only for the constitutionally protected floor that California provides, but also from the substantive provisions that we have in our statute and our regulations. As board member Thompson alluded to, while the rest of the country is getting started, California has a great deal more experience in not only legislating, but also implementing and enforcing the privacy protections in our law. I too worked at the FTC on enforcement on those very cases the last commenter mentioned, and feel that the California law not only provides stronger protections, but also is better interoperable with frameworks in other states and internationally, and better enforceable. I also wanted to thank and share my deepest gratitude for the hard work um, by Deputy Director Mahoney and the rest of this team um, that, that they've undertaken to get us here. I've witnessed the hours and hours and calls that they've all participated in and really want to appreciate uh, and, and take a moment to appreciate their work. Um, thank you all for the clear guidance and I look forward to implementing this direction with staff. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Sultani. And thank you as well for your work 
um, as well as Deputy Director Mahoney's work and the work of legal staff and others behind the scenes who have been working truly, I think, night and day to understand the implications of the proposals um, for California um, and for um, the agency and our mandate so that the board could understand it. I also want to extend my thanks to my fellow board members um, for being willing to um, you know, join a, a very quick notice meeting, to have come to this meeting so prepared uh, and to have thought so carefully about these issues on behalf of Californians. It makes me very proud to be part of this board um, uh, and to uh, have the um, ability and the honor of representing Californians' interests in this area. I also, again, want to reiterate my thanks to Congress for working on this really important issue and also for working to accommodate California's and other states' concerns. Obviously, we do not think that that work is done, um, but we do support um, privacy for all Americans. We simply can't support it at the expense of Californians. Thank you all very, very much. And with that, we will move to agenda item number three, which is adjournment. Um, may I um, have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. Um, the board will now vote whether to approve the motion. Ms. Hurtado, um, could you please conduct the roll call vote? Uh, yes. Ms. Delatore? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Chair Urban? Aye. There are five ayes and zero nays. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. Um, and thank you again um, to all of my fellow board members. The motion passes with a vote of five to zero and this special meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is now adjourned. Thank you all.